thank you. How many people have had security features go nowhere at all? I certainly have. We all come up with ideas that we think will improve security, and many of them are good ideas. During my PhD, I actually published some of these ideas. But here's the problem. Once the paper left the lab, I was on to the next thing. I didn't spend any time, invest any time, in actually selling these features. When I started at BlackBerry, I thought, hey, I've got an easy shot. I'll log a feature request, some magic will happen, and voila, everybody will be using my feature. But the real world doesn't work like that. And security features die all the time. What does it take to become a successful security feature? Well, let's take a look at an example, stack cookies. There we go. In November 96, ALF1 wrote an article for Frack on smashing the stack for fun and profit. In that article, he goes through in detail what it takes to exploit a stack-based buffer overflow vulnerability, trampling the return address. Well, in January 98, Crispin Cohen and a couple of other authors present a paper at Usenix Security, StackGuard. Their goal is simple, to protect that return address on the stack. And the idea is also fairly simple. Right? You put a cookie on the stack. Before you use the return address, you check the cookie. If the cookie's good, you have a high probability chance that the return address is also good and you can use it. If the cookie's bad, abort the program, don't touch the return address. But that's not the end of their story. In fact, that's just the beginning of their story. In August 98, they actually rewrite the patch. All right, StackGuard version 2. And in May 99, they're at Linux Expo. With, and they've actually got updated performance numbers. They'd recompiled a lot of the Red Hat packages to prove that the overhead in doing stack cookies wasn't that high. Next event on the timeline is January 2001, where ProPolice, right, which is done by some research at, researchers at IBM Research Japan, is released. And this is another rewrite of the StackGuard patch. Next event on our timeline, it's actually Microsoft releasing Visual Studio in 2003. Now, Microsoft, when they released Visual Studio with stack smashing defenses, didn't actually know about ProPolice. They didn't actually know about StackGuard. It was only after they released that they found out these, these things existed. But that same year, Chrisman and team, they're at the GCC Developers Conference. All right, and they're actually presenting the third version of the patch that they've written. So we're now at a total version of four versions of this patch. What's the end result of all of that work? Well, in 2005, June, GCC finally adapts pro, ad adopts ProPolice. Now, this is also interesting because the version they adopted wasn't actually ProPolice pro police written by IBM Research Japan, and it wasn't any of the three StackGuard patches. It was actually another version of the patch written by Richard Henderson at Red Hot. Now, once the patch had been adopted in GCC, the floodgates opened. And Red Hat appears to be the first major distro to include support for StackGuard. Right? That isn't overly surprising, considering the final patch did come from someone at Red Hat. Ubuntu was in October 2006. SUSE was in December 2006. Debian was in February 2009. And Arch was in August 2011. Basically, stack cookies at that point had passed a tipping point. Now, the feature continued to get new improvements. All right? And in May 2013, the strong option was added. All right? And adoption of that's been a lot quicker than the original work. What opened? Oh, and finally, sorry, can't forget this. In May 2000, sorry, August 2013, that original 98 Usenix paper won the Usenix Test of Time Award. So congratulations to those authors. What opened the floodgates? Well, it's fairly obvious. Adoption of the patch into GCC and Visual Studio. Let's take a look at another feature. And I'm actually going to use a feature developed internally within BlackBerry, and it's shipping on our Priv, which is our Android-based smartphone. If you take a look at Android permissions, there's five different permission levels. None, normal, dangerous, signature, and system. None. Well, that is what it sounds like. Normal permissions are automatically granted to any application that requests them. Dangerous permissions can be accepted or rejected by the end user. 
Signature permissions are only available to other applications that are signed with the same key. Right? And system permissions are restricted to applications on the base system. What happens if you, as a third-party developer, want to protect access to certain APIs? Well, you've really got three options. You've got normal, dangerous, and signature. Normal, as I said, is available to all applications. Dangerous puts enforcement in the hands of the end user. We've got three talks on usable security tomorrow. I don't think I'm giving anything away by saying that prompting the end user isn't always the best option. Right? The third option, signature. Well, signature might work for a small number of applications because you have to sign them all with the same key, but it doesn't scale. And we've also got the problem that you have to install the application defining the permission before you install the application requesting the permission. So what did we do? Our solution within the security research group at BlackBerry was con called controlled open permissions. Before, <coughs> it allows the application package to be signed with different keys, but it doesn't offload enforcement on the end user. The concept's simple. The application requesting access to the content sends a token to the application hosting the content. The application hosting the content uses a verification publicly to verify the token. If the token successfully verifies, it sends the content back. So how do we get, go about getting developers internally to use controlled open permissions? Well, we were lucky. All right? In our case, developers already realized that they had a problem. They were looking for a solution. In not, not, sorry, not in all fields do people realize that there isn't, even is a problem. If you take a look at IoT, a lot of people are just now realizing right, that we have a big problem that needs solving. So the first step for us was actually convincing the developers that this would solve their problem. Selling your solution is entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship. It's less about the technical solution than it is about all that support and other stuff around the solution. Right? For us, we had a short, concise description. We had prototype implementation, and we had detailed notes on how to use this prototype implementation. Okay. Conference papers are often too long, and you end up scaring away the exact people that you want to try and convince. We went to meetings. And in fact, we even came in on the weekends because in the transition of this research from prototype to implementation, the developers were using a hardware security module or hardware signing module that was exporting different signatures and that caused problems. Now the key is someone had to work through those problems and it gives you a lot of credibility if you work with the end users or the end developers to deploy and fix some of these issues. We all have Oh, the end result of this is we actually got the feature into the BlackBerry Common Infrastructure, which is a set of common libraries that all the BlackBerry developed applications will use on the priv. We all have a set of tools that we use for solving problems. And this includes developers. It includes companies who are looking to satisfy customer requests. It includes product managers who are looking to find new features that customers are wanting. In fact, it includes most problems of life, in including non-security related problems. So how do we get our feature or tool to be used? Well, we need to make sure that the right feature gets into the diaper bag. Okay, why a diaper bag? Three reasons. First, diaper bag has limited space. We can't just keep throwing new features at developer and expect them to use them all. How many static analysis tools are out there? Lots. How many do we expect a developer to use? One, if we're lucky. Right? And the fact that the, the, sorry, the static analysis tool that they use will be the one that they're most familiar with, the one that was mandated by management, or the one that everybody else seems to be using. Second, parents don't go into parenting with a five-day course on changing diapers. Yeah, I didn't think you'd thought you'd, yeah, sorry. You didn't think you'd hear about diapers in this talk, did you? All right, computer science students don't go into business even with a whole course on security a lot of the time. Right? And Zachary Peterson has a talk about this on the third day of Enigma. Both the diaper on the left and the diaper on the right work. Right? But which one do you think is in more people's diaper bags? People are comfortable with learning and they're, they're comfortable with messing up once or twice. But if they don't learn it quickly enough, they will switch. 
How many of us have had a lesson on using a compiler? I'm going to guess almost none of us. There's 2,000 different command line options for GCC. That's a lot of options. I only know a very, very, very small number of those. We can't assume that people will use security tools directly. In fact, I've seen cases where the security checks were disabled in static analysis tools. Right? We need to make it as easy as possible. And third, diaper bag is already par filled part way with necessary pieces. I wish I could tell my daughter to just go, to the par go on the potty. And then I could just throw everything out of the diaper bag and use it to cool carry cooler things instead of diapers. But it doesn't work like that. We can't just tell a developer to throw out everything that they have been using and use this cool new development environment. We still have C, even with the problems that it causes, because of the benefits that it also provides. The translation or transition from IPv4 to IPv6 has been really slow. And in fact, I'm not sure that IPv4 is going to be dead in my lifetime. A developer needs a compiler. They need a development environment. They need certain libraries and support. And that takes a large amount of space in the bag. And it leaves a very limited amount of space for other standalone tools. OK, so how do you go about getting your security tool or feature into the diaper bag? Well, option one, convince the developer to throw something else out. What are they going to stop using? Is there another tool that yours can replace entirely? Does your tool require relearning, or does it work similar to that old tool? Can you convince them to switch compilers? Is there another template library that has better cross-site scripting protections than the other one? SSH is, ex is an example of one tool trying to replace another. Right? SSH gave administrators things that were really useful, like automatic logins and file transfer and other things. Right? The resistance of switching means you need to be much better, not just a little bit better than the tool you're looking to replace. Option two, make your small tool small and easy to use. And I'm not talking small in terms of lines of code. I'm talking small in terms of cognitive load. There is a small amount of space in the diaper bag to add something new, especially if it fits well with the current workflow. Valgrind's an example of this. Compile your program with this extra library, and you get this extra error checking. Option three, add your feature or tool to something else that's already in there. That's what happened when StackGuard got included in GCC. And there's a whole field of compiler protections, shadow stacks, new warnings, new errors, those sorts of things that are being introduced into compilers. Static analysis. Can you add your rule to an existing static analysis tool? Or do you really need to create a whole new static analysis toolkit? Now, with static analysis, just make sure you don't turn on everything all at once. You don't want to overwhelm them. All right. And option four, okay, and I know I'm cheating just a little bit. Don't put your feature in the diaper bag. Make the baby carry it. All right, developers operate within a specific environment. All right. So make your feature part of that environment. ASLR, address space layout randomization, is an example of this. On mobile platforms, we have the sandboxing environment that's provided by default to all the application developers. If you take a look at most uh, Android applications, they're written in Java. Why is that? Because Java is the default development environment that's provided to them. If you're going to create a new smartphone, my suggestion, don't do it in Ada. Although Ada might be secure, right, you're not going to get that broad deployability that you're looking for. For StackGuard, getting the feature into GCC was their tipping point. And they didn't reach that tipping point by releasing the GCC patch. Remember, they released that GCC patch, the first version of it, back in 98. You will not reach that tipping point just by releasing a patch with your paper. They reached the tipping point because others understood the problem and the value of their solution. Microsoft released first probably because the internal security team at Microsoft had less people to convince. SE Linux is used partly because it's part of the, as part of the Linux environment. Right? But even they didn't get it in right away. They had to create the whole Linux security modules framework. Right? And they had to listen to the feedback that they were getting, take those suggestions seriously, and work with them, not get discouraged. For controlled open permissions within BlackBerry, 
the tipping point was getting into the BlackBerry Common infrastructure. For many features, it's going to be getting them into that developer diaper bag or onto the baby. However, that's not the only tipping point, and there's two others. The second is legislative changes. Not all security features are used because they're elegant, but promoting proper legislative frameworks is a whole nother talk and one I'm not going to get into. And the third is public pressure. HTTPS has long been part of the web developer diaper bag, but not everybody has used it. Edward Snowden has working on changing this, or has done a lot to change and help people to reevaluate the security features that they are using. And things like Let's Encrypt are helping to provide even easier tools. What if your feature isn't for end developers, though? What if it's for users? Well, the approach is the same, but the target audience isn't. You need to convince the people in key areas that they have a problem and you have the solution to that problem. And remember, those people might not be security experts. I know on a couple of occasions I've had to take a deep breath and relax in trying to explain and sell security. Point Guard, which is some of the work, subsequent work that Crispin did, it died. Right? I've had security features die as well. Cause of death, failure to pass that tipping point. For Stack Guard, it took probably about six months to write the paper, an initial prototype, and seven years to pass the tipping point. Adding your feature to a tool that's already in the diaper bag is probably going to be easier than adding a new tool to the diaper bag, although that's just my personal experience. And I haven't found any bulletproof approach, but things that help, elevator pitch, brief summary, and collaborations. And in fact, the closer the collaboration, the better. It's been suggested that the most successful way to transfer research into technology or into product is to transfer the people who worked on the research. It allows those most passionate about the research to help those who are responsible for its eventual deployment. Our goal as security professionals should be to change the world for the better. So let's all get out there and build better diaper bags. <laughs>